Good evening. I'm Carolyn Schoenberger, and I want to welcome you to the June edition of Immigration Issues. And I'm very thrilled to have my friend, Grzegina Zajączkowska. Zajączkowska. Um, I'm of Polish descent, and I need to improve. I, I am thrilled to have Grzegina from the Polish American Association, head of the Immigration Services and other services, as our special guest tonight. So welcome. Thank you very much for your invitation. My <laughs> pleasure. And um, we're going to talk about the Deferred Action Program and citizenship, but first I'm going to talk a little bit about the Chicago Legal Clinic. The Chicago Legal Clinic was founded in 1982 by two new lawyers. They had just passed the bar, and one of the attorneys was a priest in South Chicago. South Chicago had been a very vibrant community until they started closing the steel mills. People started losing their jobs, their homes. They couldn't afford to go out to eat or frequent local businesses. Businesses went out of business, and there were no legal services around to help people. They started the Chicago Legal Clinic, which was known as the South Chicago Legal Clinic for Immigrants, in 1982 in a one-room office near the Olive Harvey, which is part of City Colleges. And now the place grew, and now the Chicago Legal Clinic has offices not only in South Chicago, but in Pilsen, where I work, also at Austin, downtown, several offices offering free legal advice in the office of the, the, the clerk of the circuit court and the circuit court building, the lower level, uh, free child support advice, chancery, a foreclosure program, and a clinic for students at Harold Washington College, where I'm, I'm on the faculty of the business office. If you have a problem concerning immigration, social security disability, you want to buy a home or in foreclosure, a victim of domestic violence, you need a guardianship, please contact the Chicago Legal Clinic between the hours of 9 to 5. Please call Monday through Friday. The number is 773 731 1762 773 731 1762 Ahora yo voy a hablar en español por un ratito. So, bienvenido a nuestro programa. Y la clínica legal de Chicago fue establecida en 1982 por dos nuevos abogados. Un era un sacerdote en el sur de Chicago y su amigo. Y ellos decidieron de abrir una clínica legal por inmigrantes porque no había ninguna oficina de bajo costo en este lugar. Um, antes, en los 70s, había muchas acerías en el sur de Chicago, pero se cer cerraron a las acerías y la gente ha perdido su trabajo, también sus negocios, sus casas, y no había ninguna oficina de bajo costo. So, la clínica legal de Chicago empezó en 1982, en un solo cuarto en el sur de Chicago. Ahora, en 2017, hay muchas oficinas en Pilsen, donde, soy tra donde yo trabajo, en Austin, al centro. Hay oficinas que dan aviso, uh, consejo gratis en el Daily Center, mantenimiento de los niños, foreclosures, si quiere cambiar su nombre. Y también en Harold Washington College, donde soy profesora, hay una clínica legal por los estudiantes. Entonces, si usted tiene un problema de inmigración, necesita ayuda con bienes raíces, foreclosure, seguro social de incapacidad, testamentos, tutelas, ha de llamar a la oficina central de la clínica legal de Chicago entre las horas de 9 hasta las 5 el lunes hasta el viernes, por favor llame a 773-731-1762, 773-731-1762, y la mayor parte de, de la gente que trabaja con la Clínica Legal de Chicago puede hablar español. Entonces, llámanos y vamos a tratar de darle ayuda. Entonces, esta noche hablaremos con mi amiga, hablaremos de DACA y también para ponerse ciudadana. 
Y uh, si tiene una pregunta, hay que llamar la, el número a uh, 312-738-1060. Llámanos, por favor, si tiene preguntas. I invite you to please contact the number on your screen if you have questions, 312-738-1060. And you can call, you can ask in Spanish, English, French, and Polish. So, uh, and Garzina would be more than happy to answer the calls in Polish. Um, so, again, I want to thank Regina, who is my friend for many years, for coming on the show and, and to welcome you. Thank you very much. So, this week we've seen some very interesting developments with the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. So, people who are already DACAs, are they safe? That's the question people ask me. Are we safe? What do you think? I believe that you know the the I believe the children who uh, came here uh, before June 15, 2007, the first act. I believe that you know so far, you know every legal uh, organization and also you know, I believe acts. If we check them, they are pretty safe. Although two days ago we just learned that uh, the second part, which was. Uh, established in uh, 2014 by President Obama. Uh, unfortunately, the, you know, the later date, which was established uh, for 2010, no longer is, should be taken under consideration. So they revoked? And also the DAPA. Okay. And DAPA was for? DAPA was for, for parents of those children who applied for the uh, first uh, benefit. So, DAPA was for parents of U.S. citizen children, and that no longer exists. And the expanded Deferred Action for Childhood Arrival, which allowed you to apply if you were here, I think it was in 2012? 2012, That yes. no longer exists. It was stopped by the courts, and now it's completely gone. For the moment, the people who have Deferred Action based on the original Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, are safe. So we're, we have a discussion in the office. What do we tell people who want to apply now? What do we tell them? Uh, in our case, we, we just uh, always ask our clients to really uh, think it over, you know, whether it's worth it for even for children. Uh, we understand that, you know, when you're 16, you really need, you know, to be, to have your, your circle friends and also uh, to have friends at school and they all drive and you want to, your, to get your driver's license. But the risk is still there and we are not sure that the risk is worth it. Yeah. So and, this and is always uh, for, for the client. Client has to make the final decision they have to take under consideration, they have to take their parents, their uh, maybe their siblings and relatives if they live together. This is extremely important. We don't want to scare anyone. If you really made a serious decision and you want to apply, if you're eligible for the first one, uh, if you came to this country before June 15, 2007, uh, and you are older than 15 years old, then you can apply for the first the DACA benefit. But uh, you it's always risky. have to yes, consider your relatives, your friends, uh, your entire family. Today someone came to the office who wants to apply for DACA and we went through that there is no guarantee that that program will continue to exist and you're letting the Immigration Service know that you're here. And he insisted he was going to get DACA, and then in four years, he was going to take an English course, and in four years, he was going to leave the country, and because a citizen would pick him up, he would then get a green card. And he heard it on a television program, at which point I said, fine, I'll call the station. What was actually discussed, because he showed me the program, was that if you are a DACA and English classes don't cut it. You've got to get a GED or have a high school diploma. Um, and you would apply for advanced parole, but even advanced parole, we don't know if they're going to let someone back in. 
And only if you're married to a U.S. citizen would you then get a green card. So he had things completely wrong. There's so much gossip and rumor out there. It's, it's heartbreaking. But again, um, I think that what you said, I completely agree with. You have to consult with your family, your friends. It's risky not only for you, but it's risky for them. Absolutely, and also it's extremely hard to document some uh, periods of times because we have to remember that uh, the child uh, had to come to America before June 15, 2007. So since that date, they have to document that they never left the country. Uh, usually during the school, school days, it's not too hard because school can provide you the right. documentation and, uh, uh, of course, uh, information that you were present. You also were visiting uh, doctors and you had some other activities which can also help you to document it. But, uh, for example, in, uh, to Poles and to Eastern Europeans, it's extremely hard to document uh, the summertime. Quite often those children just sit at home and they don't really participate in other activities. And then you, they don't have any information which can document the, you know, those specific periods. It, it is very hard and the cases that we have created of people who are older than 18, um, we're looking at bank statements, we're looking at bills, we're looking at phone records, we're looking medical at medical bills. records. Mm -hmm. We end up with a, with a book like this. So again, I'm, I'm not going to say that we're not going to where people should not apply, but they should carefully, I, I couldn't agree more. They should talk with their family, their friends, see what documentation they have. Um, I still can't get over the fact that this young gentleman felt that if he left the country and came back with DACA that he would get a green card if someone met him who was a United States citizen. Um, that is an example of the gossip and the, and the rumors that's going on right now. Even with advanced parole, which is not uh, you know, easy to get, uh, they, it still can be the, the situation that, that you know, they will be stopped at the border and uh, they would have to sort of uh, go back. So you really have to think it through. And I believe the young people, you know, it's beautiful. It, the time is on their side, you know. We will maybe, we, we don't uh, always uh, have to live the situation which right now all the laws change, everything changes. So we have to have hope and uh, hope for, the, for something better to come along. But absolutely we don't want to discourage, but you have to really think it through and make a right decision for you and for your family. Uh, everything is up in the air. I went in on a citizenship case a couple of weeks ago, and, and not only did they want you know, confirmation that my client had been paying his child support, they wanted the original order. It wasn't enough to say he was in compliance. They wanted the original order. So again, everything, not that, citizenship statutes, there are regulations, but I think that everything is becoming somewhat harder right now. We have to be more precise. We, we should uh, document every, every period of our lives. Uh, it's the same thing with Polish uh, clients who would like to become citizens. Uh, they spend a lot of time uh, on, uh, you know, sort of uh, memorizing and uh, learning uh, civics and uh, U.S. history, but unfortunately they also have to answer simple questions from the application. And because the application right now consists of 20 pages of information, uh, sometimes if you are old and you, you know, you really uh, tried very hard to, you know, to, to gather your information, but not necessarily you remember them all when you're under very big stress at the interview. So right now, we, to our clients who uh, apply for citizenship, we always tell them also you have to really read your application, the copy of your application thoroughly. You have to remember every fact you put in it. Uh, you also have to provide the documentation. Sometimes it's, it's very hard for them. Uh, if they have, let's say, they had uh, 
some losses in their family or they had two or three marriages. Uh, in this country or even in the old country, it's sometimes it's very hard to get the documentation. Yes. And they all have to have it at the interview. They, the officer always can ask for the document which shows uh, the specific dates uh, and the facts which are uh, in, the, in the application. So. Can you please just give a short um, summary of what you said in Polish so for people who are Polish speaking? Absolutely, with they pleasure. Nazywam się Grażyna Zajączkowska i reprezentuję Zrzeszenie Amerykańsko-Polskie. Jest to organizacja, po angielsku brzmi to Polish American Association. Ja jestem dyrektorem do spraw imigrantów i jestem odpowiedzialna za dział imigracyjny i za dział do tak zwanych spraw mieszkaniowych, ale przez wiele lat pracuję dla organizacji ponad w tej chwili prawie 30 lat i pracowałam w różnych działach. Zrzeszenie Amerykańsko-Polskie również y, y, ma działy takie jak dział nauczania, który jest ogromnie duży. Mamy około 2000 studentów w różnych klasach i kursach, między innymi właśnie y, klasach przygotowujących do y, egzaminu na obywatelstwo. Y, mamy również wiele klas tak zwanych kursów zawodowych. Na przykład kurs przygotowujący osoby do pracy jako tak zwany asystent pielęgniarki. Mamy kursy komputerowe, mamy przede wszystkim ogromny dział przygotowujący Polonię do mówienia po angielsku. Mamy bardzo duży program ESL, tak zwany English as a Second Language i wiele innych również klas i kursów nawet dla młodzieży w tej chwili. Mamy również dział, który zajmuje się zatrudnieniem, tak zwany dział, w którym przygotowujemy i pomagamy Państwu złożyć aplikację o nową pracę, jak również możecie Państwo, pomagamy przy zrobieniu tak zwanego rezume, czyli CV. Wiele innej pomocy możecie Państwo uzyskać w naszym dziale nauczania i dziale, dziale zatrudnienia. Mamy bardzo duży również dział pomocy socjalnej. Tutaj mamy mnóstwo programów, programy dla y, osób, które potrzebują pomocy y, na przykład y, jeżeli chodzi o przemoc domową, dla ofiar, ale również dla tych, którzy y, po prostu no, niestety y, byli y, osobami, które, które po prostu były w takich sytuacjach. Y, mamy programy, które pomagają Państwu przygotować i wypełnić mnóstwo aplikacji o tak zwane świadczenia społeczne, jak na przykład y, kartę LINK, czyli Osoby, które już przychodzą na emerytury, bardzo często mają bardzo niskie emerytury. E, tutaj mamy ten słynny polski e, pro, e, problem, który e, jak gdyby łączenia e, emerytur. Wiele tych rzeczy rozwiązywanych jest i bardzo Państwu pomagamy przez seminaria, które organizujemy, e, do których serdecznie zachęcam, aby w nich uczestniczyć. Bardzo dużo Państwo się dowiecie. Ja e, zarządzam działem do spraw im, e, imigracyjnych i bardzo proszę aby wszystkie takie pytania proszę właśnie przesyłać do naszego działu. Najlepiej jest zadzwonić na nasz główny numer, czyli 773 282 8206 i w przypadku, kiedy Państwo nie znacie poszczególnych wewnętrznych numerów i osób, które mogą Wam pomóc, najlepiej jest zadzwonić na zero, czyli do naszego sekretariatu, które Państwa połączy z odpowiednim pracownikiem. Ja myślę, że ta organizacja będzie Państwu naprawdę pomocna. Myślę, że wiele, wiele rzeczy rozwiązujemy i przygotowujemy. Także serdecznie zachęcam i zapraszam do dzwonienia i również do mnie. Mój wewnętrzny jest 342. Thank you. Good, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Proszę uh, bardzo. <laughs> one other topic just dealing with citizenship is if someone is arrested um, they can have their criminal record either expunged or sealed. And I have a case right now where someone wants to apply to become a citizen, and we have to get a certified copy of a case that was dismissed in court. So to do that, I now have to go before a judge for permission for access to the sealed records, get the records out, have them sealed, and then have it resealed. It's going to take at least two trips to court, um, our fees are not great, but it's going to add a couple of hundred dollars. Uh, we haven't even figured out yet how to do this. So 
I think it's really important for people who are seeking to become a citizen, who were arrested, did something really stupid. Number one, talk to someone before you apply to make sure that's not going to get you deported. And the second thing is before you get your record expunged or sealed, please get a certified copy because the worst thing is to be in an interview and the person who's running the interview asks you for a record that is certified and all you have is a copy and then you get 30 days to get it. So again, I, I would add to that. Uh, if I may. Sure. Yes, this is a big problem. You know, for, for many years, uh, quite often uh, someone who had uh, some problems with the law, uh, they of course want to forget right away, you know, that it happened and as soon as they completed whatever it was necessary uh, to regain, let's say, their driver's license with the UI or something, they usually uh, are, you know, usually their lawyers suggest, why don't we expand that? It takes time later to deal with it, to find it, you know, to find the, the record. It takes, uh, you know, like you said, you know, uh, several uh, sometimes trips to court to judge, you know, to see and, you know, to be able, you know, to, to get the information. Unfortunately, that information is very important for citizenship. Uh, otherwise, you know, it will be denied and you not only will be extremely upset and, of course, you know, that you didn't get it, but also, uh, you will lose a lot of money. Right now, the fee for citizenship is $725. So it's a lot of money for many people. And they really would love it to, to finally to be able to, to become citizen, to vote, to, to be able to sponsor the, the relatives from a, you know old country. Or, you know, there are so many important things. We, we can vote, and voting is one of those Especially things. Especially now. <laughs> Especially now, the important to vote, but only vote, please, if you're a citizen. Absolutely. That's another uh, thing we have to warn our, you know, our audience. Absolutely, you cannot vote, or even you should not absolutely register if you are not citizen. Uh, unfortunately, uh, sometimes people, when they try to renew their driver's license, they are being asked the question, uh, have you registered to vote? Uh, sometimes they are so uh, nervous after the examination uh, or renewing their driver's licenses that uh, they say yes, and unfortunately they are already registered. In that case, if you never voted and you are you know, you can go to the uh, Chicago election, uh, uh, the Board of Elections, board of election, yeah. and you can re-register. It takes time, but uh, there, there is a way. But absolutely no one can vote who is not United States citizen. And I know that the Secretary of State's office is aware of this problem, that they are working on this, they're training people. Um, a court order prohibits them from asking, are you a citizen? So, again, it, it is very difficult, um, but I know they're working on this and have really had some success in trying to keep people from voting who uh, should not be voting because they're not a uh, United States citizen. Grigina, thank you for what you do. Thank you for coming on the show. I always enjoy working with you. I want to thank you. I want to thank everyone for watching and that we will be back the third Wednesday in July, where I will introduce the new executive director of the Chicago Legal Clinic to you. Um, if you have questions again regarding immigration, um, do not ignore any notice to appear in court. If you have any problems regarding Social Security disability, please call the number on the screen, 773-731-1762, 773-731-1762. One seven six two, Monday through Friday from nine to five. Again, thank you, thank you, Regina. Or to Polish American Association. Well, which the number is <laughs> in Polish. Uh, you can. Uh, it's seven seven three two eight two eight two zero six. Absolutely. Thank you very much, and good thank night. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs>